Okay, this slide I'm going to use to introduce chemical digestion. So chemical digestion is when we need enzymes produced at different locations. So there isn't just one organ that can produce all the different enzymes we need. But we need enzymes to chemically break down food. All right, and that's done by breaking the bonds within the molecule. All right, so when we ingest food, food is a combination of basically six nutrients. You've got the macronutrients, which are carbohydrates, lipids, and protein. All right, so those are large molecules. A macronutrient is a large molecule that needs to be chemically broken down. The micronutrients include your vitamins and your minerals. Those molecules do not need to be chemically broken down. So we don't need any enzymes for vitamins and, and minerals. All we need to be able to do is absorb them. And then the sixth one is water. Water is, you know, depending on who you're talking to, considered a nutrient or not. You don't have to chemically digest water. Um, you just have to absorb it in. So the macronutrients are going to require enzymes. Uh, carbohydrates are going to be chemically broken down into monosaccharides. All right, so those are the single units that form carbohydrates. Lipids, in this case triglycerides, this is a triglyceride, needs to be chemically digested down into fatty acids and monoglycerides, and then proteins need to be chemically digested down into amino acids. So once we get them into these smaller products, we can then absorb them into the body. Okay, so we're going to begin our journey starting at the oral cavity, and obviously when you look in an oral cavity you see a tongue, all right, you also see teeth. You've got some upper teeth in your upper maxillary bone. And then you've got some lower teeth in your mandible. And looking in that oral cavity, we see the uvula kind of dangling down from the soft palate. And then the hard palate being made up of bone. Um, what's the tongue going to do? Well, the tongue is a muscular organ. It has muscles within it. It also has muscles attached to it. So the tongue is going to be utilized to kind of mix the saliva that's going to be entering your oral cavity from the salivary glands. So we're going to have to learn about salivary glands and their product, which we call saliva. Notice teeth have different you know, names. We've got the incisors in the front. We have the canines that come kind of next. Then we have premolars and molars. Uh, and those teeth have different shapes because they perform different types of uh, chewing mechanisms, whether it's um, kind of slicing and cutting the food, tearing the food, or, or crushing the food. Uh, you probably should have learned about taste back in AMP1. Um, taste is done using taste buds that are housed within the papillae. Uh, the papillae are these larger structures scattered throughout the tongue that, that house the taste buds. At the back of the tongue, re recall the lingual tonsil. Uh, we can also see the palatine tonsils on each side. And then way in the back, we see an epiglottis. That epiglottis is going to make sure that the food and drink we swallow doesn't go down the respiratory track. Okay, so let's take a look at teeth a little more. Um, a tooth is primarily made up of a material called dentin. Uh, it's a very hard, calcified uh, connective tissue, uh, similar to bone, but it's not bone. Teeth are not classified as bones. Um, the crown is covered with a material called enamel. And enamel is even harder than the dentin. It's going to help protect uh, the tooth. Um, the teeth are going to be sitting in, again, either the maxillary bones, if they're the upper teeth, 
or the mandi mandible if they're mandibular or lower teeth. And in an adult, a normal typical adult, there's 32 teeth, uh, 16 on the top and 16 on the bottom. Uh, before that, we have 20 deciduous teeth. Deciduous means falling out. So these are your baby teeth or your primary teeth uh, that eventually fall out or uh, someone pulls them out for you. All right. Um, again, the teeth are used kind of for different types of chewing. Um, again, the, the, the incisors are in the front. Uh, so central incisors, then lateral incisors, then canines and then you have molars in the back. All right. Um, salivary glands. So you got a lot of different salivary glands. Some of them are little glands, but you got three big ones. Uh, you have the parotid salivary gland. Parotid means near the ear. So it's way back here by your ear, and then it has a little duct that transports the saliva uh, into the oral cavity. You've got sublingual salivary glands which lie just beneath the tongue, and they have a bunch of little ducts that secrete the saliva. And then you have submandibular salivary glands that also have a duct that secretes the saliva into the mouth. Uh, these salivary glands are stimulated by parasympathetic neurons found in the facial and glossopharyngeal cranial nerves. So what is saliva? Um, saliva has a lot of water in it. Um, it has a molecule called bicarbonate that's going to act as a buffer. Uh, so bicarbonate can kind of uh, remove protons or hydrogens from the solution uh, and prevent your mouth from becoming too acidic. Uh, a lot of our foods are acidic, and what the acid could do is erode the enamel on your teeth. Uh, so this bicarbonate really serves two major purposes. One, protects the enamel from acid. Uh, number two, it maintains a relatively constant pH um, for enzymatic digestion. Uh, the enzyme that does the digestion in your mouth is known as salivary amylase. So salivary amylase is an enzyme that comes from saliva, and it starts our carbohydrate digestion. So carbohydrates are going to be, you know, in the breads you eat. And um, carbohydrates can be in a lot of different forms. They can be very big carbohydrates or they can be smaller carbohydrates. But we initiate digestion of these carbohydrates immediately in your mouth. But this enzyme requires the pH to be fairly neutral. So if you're eating foods that have, you know, very low pH, this enzyme might not work unless you can buffer that pH. There is a lipase uh, that is produced in saliva. It doesn't really work in your mouth. Um, it prefers a lower pH, so it's, it's going to start its function more in the stomach. So lingual lipase, a lipase digests lipids. And the lipid that we have to digest are triglycerides. Uh, but again, it doesn't really work in your mouth. It works in the stomach. So amylases digest carbohydrates. Lipases digest triglycerides. There's also an enzyme that can kill bacteria called lysozyme in your saliva. Uh, you could have some antibodies in your saliva. Uh, IgA antibodies could actually help to block pathogens. Uh, from getting into your tissues. All right, so those are the salivary glands, your basic components of saliva, and then what nerves stimulate the production of that saliva. And these nerves will actually get activated even just by thinking of food. So if you think of food or maybe you start to smell food, you'll start to stimulate these salivary glands even before you take a bite of food. All right, so then what happens? Well, you're, don't forget you're going to chew your food, right? So you're going to have mastication. So you're going to use 
muscles of mastication such as your masseter and your temporalis muscles in order to move that mandible up and down, front and back, side to side. You're going to form what's known as the bolus. All right, so notice right here we formed a bolus. So that's the chewed up food, so mechanically digested. We've mixed in the saliva. We're probably starting to digest the carbohydrates. And your tongue is going to help move that bolus posteriorly. All right, at the to the back of the oral cavity, and that's a voluntary process. All right, so there's what's called the voluntary phase of deglutition. Uh, deglutition is the act of swallowing. Once that bolus moves into the throat, so remember we're going to use our oropharynx and then laryngopharynx. All right, soft palate's going to move up because we don't want that food to go up into the nasopharynx. So the soft palate blocks it from going up and the epiglottis is going to close off the respiratory tract. So now we can guide that bolus into the oropharynx, into the laryngopharynx, and then on into the uh, esophagus. Sorry, the esophagus. So now we see it enter the esophagus there's a little sphincter that has to relax called the upper esophageal sphincter. That's going to help open up that esophagus, and the bolus will then enter. Then the esophagus takes over, and the esophagus is going to use the process of peristalsis to move the bolus down until it enters the stomach. So we see here the process of peristalsis in the esophagus. Peristalsis involves the combination of circular muscle contraction, which kind of squeezes, and then longitudinal muscle contraction, which pushes. And that's going to move that bolus all the way down until it gets to the bottom or end of the esophagus. It's kind of like if you were to squeeze toothpaste out of a, 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 a tube of toothpaste. You typically kind of squeeze on it and then push. And that's the process of peristalsis. Once it reaches the bottom of the esophagus, there's another sphincter called the lower esophageal sphincter. That sphincter has to relax in order to open up the stomach. So then the bolus will enter the stomach. And then, very important, is to allow that lower esophageal sphincter to contract again in order to prevent that bolus from going back up or even more importantly to prevent stomach acid from going up into that esophagus. Okay, next video we're going to talk about the stomach. Uh, we're going to spend quite a bit of time there because there's, there's quite a bit of anatomy to get down. Um, there's quite a bit of cells that function in your stomach. Um, so we're going to start a nice new video talking about the stomach.